So who was the person Yitro? Yitro was Moshe's father-in-law. He belonged to a people called the Midianites. He was a seeker. He had worshipped every possible god that was known in the ancient hierarchy of gods. He was seeking something. Okay, because he was developing himself and his seeking was sincere, he ended up as Pharaoh's advisor. When Pharaoh asked him what to do about the Jewish problem, the Jewish problem, yeah, he said there is no Jewish problem. There is no, there's nothing problematic about the Jews living in your kingdom. He recommended that he do nothing against the Jews. His reward for this advice was that a death sentence was put upon him and he had to escape. So he was living in the desert. Okay, he still referred to his Kohen Midian, the priest of Midian, but at that point, former priest of Midian would have been much more um, accurate. Okay, Moshe was an Egyptian prince at this time. Okay, he saw an Egyptian beating a Jew and he killed the Egyptian and he also had to escape. They end up meeting. Moshe marries Zipporah, Yitro's daughter. Okay, at which point, sometime afterwards, he had the burning bush vision, goes to Egypt, liberates the Jews, and then Yitro and his daughter, who, was, who went back to Egypt, because Moshe said, there are enough Jews suffering in Egypt. You don't we don't have to add another one. They rejoin. OK, clear? Yitro then tells Moshe, you have to institute a justice system. You can't do everything yourself. So the first thing we have to know about Yitro and about anyone is everybody's life doesn't begin necessarily at the time they came into the world this time around. In Judaism, there is a belief in reincarnation. And I want to explain it to you because there are many, many misunderstandings about this topic. Here's what it doesn't mean. I picked up French really well. I bet, but I didn't. OK, um, I bet like last incarnation, I was the Prince of Monte Cristo. No, what it means is like this. Everybody has a purpose in being, which is why we're so different. And concerning this, it says, great is the king who mints many coins, and each one is different. Each is separate. Let's say you don't finish everything you were supposed to do. Let's say you don't. So the world still needs what you were meant to contribute. So you have to come back to complete it. So the Arvizal, who lived around 500 years ago, said already in his time there are no new people. No new souls. We're all busy completing what we could have. A person may be up to their second time around, their third time around. It's not that important. So I want to tell you why we don't remember past lives, because there's a great deal of talk in the New Age world about like past life recall. Okay, The reason is every life is meant to be a challenge. If you knew all I have to do is A, then you would devote your life to it. There'd be no challenge to it. So God put up a fence. We don't remember our past lives, nor do we have to. There's no particular reason to remembering this. So I'll tell you a story about how this actually works, a true story. This, and it made it to the rabbinic literature. So these kind of stories, you know, like, eh, it's like, it's, it's solid. It's in the legal books as well. OK, there was a very wealthy man who lived in Poland a, over, a little over 500 years ago. It was Moshe, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, his last name was Abelus, OK? Fabulously wealthy. In those days, matches were arranged. OK, so he wanted a brilliant Torah scholar for his daughter. He went to a scholar who was, named, who was known by his acronym, the Maharshal, who recommended, he said, there's someone in Egypt. He's brilliant. This is who you want. So in spite of the cultural differences and whatever, he and his daughter decided to go for it. The wedding was held in Egypt because he had like limitless funds. He could bring his friends, relatives, everyone to the wedding in Egypt, while the family in Egypt were not, would not be able to bring them to Europe. So the wedding was held there. Beautiful occasion. A couple of months after the wedding, the young husband, who had been given a vast fortune so that he could spend his entire life devoted to study and teaching, died suddenly. Okay. So now here's where the legal part begins. Who, below, who owns the money? So you would think, normally, I made a mistake. It wasn't the young man who died. The, the bride died. The bride died. OK, clear? So the question is, who owns the money? Does she, since the father gave all of this money for her benefit, should it revert to him? 
Or since the natural order of things is if a woman dies, her husband inherits the money, should go to the husband. So there's a big court case about this because a lot of money was involved. It involved judges from the entire world. This so that, true uh, story? What? This is, true story? this is true. This is true, and that's why the legal part of it is very interesting. The legal part made it to the legal tomes over whether a conditional in, whether there's such a thing as a conditional inheritance. Okay, clear? So um, as things worked out, the scholars in Egypt went according to the Rambam's opinion, which is that unconditionally, a husband always inherits from his wife. The scholars in Europe went to an alternative, decent, valid legal opinion, which would maintain if an inherit that there could be a conditional inheritance. So they got together. They didn't come to a real conclusion. So by this time, the, um, the father of the bride who had died was in Egypt. And um, the court decided against him, but he, uh, and there was no place further to take it. But the judges saw that he was terribly disturbed because there was legitimate ground for finding in his benefit. It isn't as though it was a zero, a hundred kind of a case. It was a 59, 49 kind of a case, if you understood what I mean with 10% in doubt. So they said there's a Kabbalistic scholar here. He's brilliant. His name is Yitzchak Ashkenazi. So even though he is living here, his name, Ashkenazi, tells you that he's originally from Ashkenaz, from Europe, and he'll, he'll grasp your side of the case very well as well. He's totally unbiased. So this was the Arizal. His acronym is, is Rabbeinu Yitzchak Ashkenazi. Okay? And um, he went before him. So he heard the entire case, read everything there was to read on it, sat in meditation. He was a young man, by the way sat in meditation for a significant amount of time. And then he said, it has to go according to the din and the judgment, which is a very cryptic thing to say. So he said, well, what does that mean con concretely? Uh, am I going to receive the money, or is the young man going to receive the money? He said, give it to him. So he said, I want you to write down the legal basis of your opinion, which you're allowed to do in court. And he said, my basis is coming from a different place. So he said, what's your basis? So he said, he's the author, by the way, of like all major Kabbalistic works today stem from his, from his Kabbalah. Okay? One of his books is a book called Shah Gilgulim, The Gate of Incarnation. He said, in a previous life, in a previous life, your daughter had borrowed money and not returned it to this man and it had to be returned, OK? So let it go. So he, so he said, how do you know this? Okay. So he pointed out to the Zohar, where the word din is translated not like we always translate it, which is law, but it's translated Gilgalaya, which means law via reincarnation. So reincarnation has to do with, again, finishing unfinished things. It could be positive that a person is almost perfect. They just have a very small task to do. It could be reflective of profound imperfection, as in the story I told you. So why am I telling you this? Yitro was an incarnation of Cain. Moshe was an incarnation of Hevel. Who were Cain and Hevel, do you know? Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel. So let's look at the Cain and Abel story for a moment. So there they are, Adam's children in the Garden of Eden. Okay, Cain, like Yitro, saw the world as his oyster. Everything is for me. I had to seek it. He wanted also to have deep spiritual experience. So he offered something to God. He made an offering, but it was what he, could, what he couldn't use. It was just flaxseed. Conversely, Hevel, Abel, said, this world is worth nothing on its own. Everything in this world is death-bound, which is true. Okay, the only things that are worth anything are spirit. Who was right from a Judaic perspective? Neither one of them were right. Okay, got this? The world does have value, but it doesn't have infinite value. So therefore, they had to come back. Moshe who by his nature was very transcendental, understood mitzvot which use this worldly things. Yitro understood that all the this worldly seeking he could do leads you back to God. So they had to meet each other. 
Okay, so that's how reincarnation works. How do you know these people are a reincarnation of the other? Oh, how would I know? I don't know anything. I like. You learned that these were the reincarnation? How did they have known that? So the Arizal knew enough about how reincarnation works through being the intellectual heir of Shimon Bar Yochai that he could look at someone, hear about their history, see what they look like, and see their whole, their whole story. Yeah, there have, been even la- there have been even later Kabbalists who could do this. But there are only a few cases where they actually identified who were the incarnations of other people. They have no interest in telling. In other words, as I told you at the beginning of this topic, in general, there's a, a partition separating you from past lives, and it's purposeful. And only in rare circumstances is this going to be revealed to any. The real, the, I want to give you a rule about real Kabbalists, because there are very numerous fake Kabbalists out there. Those who know don't talk, and those who talk don't know. Got it? Mm-hmm.